I'm glad to present our next speaker, uh, Professor Mark Aspinwall. He's a professor of politics, head of department of politics and international relations at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Aspinwall was born on 1957 and has both the British and American citizenship. He studied, among others, at the London School of Economics. He also did his PhD in international relations. He also worked as professional staffer in the US House of Representatives and at Washington lobbyist for a consorti consortium of ship owners. Since 2002, he holds a position as professor of politics, first at the Robert Gordon University and since 2004 at the University of Edinburgh, where he teaches international relations and international political economy. His research focuses on regional integration, especially in North America and Europe, and especially regarding the effects of regional integration on domestic policies. Please welcome with me Professor Aspenwall. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and for the invitation. And uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, and to meet many of you during the, the course of these last few days. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor. Um, and I, I guess I would start like some others um, with a couple of stories about myself and my, my experience with um, cultural uh, pluralism, cultural uh, differentiation. Uh, I, when I was 19 years old, I think it was, I was um, like many Americans on a backpacking tour of Europe and, and Africa with some friends and, and at the end of it ended up in, in England and thought, this is an absolutely beautiful place. Why didn't I think to come here for a year abroad? I think it was York, the York Minster, or Durham, or someplace like that. I have to come back to this place and live here. Well, uh, I've lived there for 22 years now. My first wife was English, um, and so I suppose that was one of the ways that I became a British citizen, and then I, be, I, I sort of uh, f found an entry into the UK. Uh, my second wife is Mexican, and I'm not actually marrying people in order to have cultural experiences, I can assure you. Um, but my, my present wife, uh, now the plan is that this is the last one, actually, uh, is uh, from Mexico. And uh, I was in Mexico only about a year after my time in England. Uh, and my, my first time in Mexico, I was also very young, again, with one of the same friends, uh, and ended up in a jail, uh, in, thrown into jail overnight only for one night. Uh, on a misunderstanding, spent the night there, and I, I, I still have the diaries that I keep for my travel, kept for my travels all those decades ago. And it was clear that I didn't think much of the Mexicans <laughs> at that point in time. Um, but uh, one of the things that I really wanted to impress uh, upon you from my perspective in this talk is that uh, the, the way that we, that we come to understand cultures and the way that we respond to others very much, I think, depends on who we are as a person. If we are so in, th that way inclined, we will make the most of cultural difference and use it to our advantage and work with it, learn about other places, understand them better. But, but if we're not that way inclined, it won't, it won't matter how much exposure we have, how much we learn about other cultures, we still won't find uh, as much value in them as we should. Uh, I'm about to move to Mexico, actually, for the, the coming year. Um, where I'll be working on sabbatical and doing research, which is where my research currently is focused. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to people about it uh, informally or answer questions on, um, on it, but I, how developing countries in particular, this is a critical thing, I think, for, for, for global politics and for international relations and for our study of development, how they come to accept the rule of law, accept good governance norms, what attitude shifts, how attitudes actually change among bureaucrats, among police, among judicial officials, so that corruption becomes less tolerated as a, as a, as a given norm. This is what I'm looking at in Mexico. Um, I'm gonna come back to this, because I actually wanted to um, raise four, four issues briefly without uh, slides, I'm afraid, because um, I've put some notes together fairly last minute, um, but these are really important. One is to think about the definition of cultural diplomacy a little bit, and you'll have to excuse me, as, a, um, as an academic, um, I'm prone, like other academics, John Hobson was saying this yesterday, to pick things apart, to not accept given definitions, to problematize things, to maybe to overanalyze, uh, to question uh, and to, to probe and things like that, but I think that's how our, our um, our understanding grows. So I'll think about the definition with you a little bit. Um, I'll also, pr I'll also th tell you, I think, that culture can divide as well as unify. 
and a couple of examples of that, I guess. Um, then a, the, the third thing is to think about the purpose of diplomacy, what, what, what use it's made, uh, cultural diplomacy, what use uh, it's put to. And the fourth, which is the most important and really the rationale for this, is to talk about a new form of cultural division, which I think is increasingly growing between technocrats and the rest. Technocrats who have uh, common frames of reference, common educations, common technical experience and training and so forth, like many of those who have come to this, to this conference, the professionals. You, okay, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, M Monocle Magazine, I had never heard of Monocle Magazine, came up in the pub quiz that I go to, uh, Monocle Magazine publishes top 10 countries uh, for culture, listed and uh, uh, created according to their politics, their diplomacy, their sport, their business, and so, and so forth. And this read to me almost like an equivalent, a kind of, uh, I mean, a kind of synonym for, for a list of countries uh, at high levels of development, development in every sense of the word, human uh, development and, and growth and economic development and so forth. The top, you know, the usual suspects, Scandinavian, Canada and so forth, um, but, but including um, basically these developed countries. And, and I thought, well, is that what, uh, is, is that what, is that what it's all about? Is, is that what it is? The, the developed country's culture is the one that's held up as the, as the paragon, as the virtue that we have to uh, achieve uh, in the developing world, and, and that's the end of the story. I think also culture is it's a bit like the, the supplements in a Sunday newspaper. You know, you take the, the front cover off with all the hard news, that's the hard politics. Inside you have the business insert, you have the sports, you have home and garden, you have a life and, and, and all the arts and so forth. And so everything inside the front, the, the front section of the Sunday newspaper is what we would think, is what I would think of as the culture. But, but underlying that, it's not simply those things, underlying that culture is about the values. It's about the values and beliefs that a people hold. And these things aren't necessarily synonymous with states, but they're synonymous enough with states that, that uh, here and in other places, we think of cultures being, um, being national. The, the leaflets that I saw up here are, are basically um, from various different countries. Um, and we have diplomats, we have um, members of governments here representing governments. So the diplomacy part of, of Cultural diplomacy implies national boundaries. It implies national differences. It implies the need for ambassadors, for translators, for, for cultural translators, for cultural diplomats. And in that, uh, I think we need to do more to improve our, at least in, in, in the Anglophone countries, we need to do more to improve our understandings of other languages, to improve our fluency in other languages, because without that, we don't understand enough about other cultures. We have uh, in the uh, University of Edinburgh, we have uh, a, a big uh, Erasmus program. Uh, we have a big uh, foreign exchange program. Um, and we, we, we contribute to the Erasmus exchanges that, that, that uh, send some 4 million or so. However, uh, we, it, spe it spends about 400 million euros per year to send students and members of staff overseas. About 200,000 students per year take advantage of the Erasmus program. And, at the University of Edinburgh were big contributors to that. About 40,000 lecturers go abroad every year as well. So this is an important way for students to develop a fluency in, in other cultures to understand them better. And I think this is really important. Interestingly, one-sixth of these students, when they go overseas for their third year in university, they don't go to a foreign university, they go to a foreign company. So the, the cultural understandings that they gain aren't simply university-generated ones, uh, university-based ones, but are also uh, from, from, from different kinds of uh, companies. And in fact, there's a, there's a big literature, if you're, under, if you're familiar with politics and international political economy and comparative political economy, there's a literature on the culture of capitalism, the various different kinds of capitalisms. And so our students come to, to understand that better. Um, but we, and, and, and also at Edinburgh, we're about to open offices in Latin America. We're doing a big promotion drive to increase our exposure to and our, um, our, our, our profile in Brazil and in Mexico and Colombia and in Chile. And so we're sending a person to open an office in these places. And this is all great. We're using, uh, we, we've given an honorary degree to Pele. Uh, this is 
very much you know, to, to, to promote our own interest as a university. Um, and we're using the arts and sport in order, Chris Hoy is a, who's a graduate of, of the University of Edinburgh, to try to generate a better awareness of the University of Edinburgh. So we're using cultural activities to do this. Uh, but um, that brings me to point number two, which is that um, although not in this case, I know, and not in the Erasmus case, um, culture can divide. And, and I was thinking of this when Ian Gillen was talking a couple of nights ago, how the music of Deep Purple was banned in different places and different regimes because music is music is about is is about protest. It, it, oftentimes, at least pop music, contemporary music, it's about uh, it's about resistance. It's about speaking to power, and and that can be frightening. That can that can rally those who who are who are uh, uh, disenfranchised or, un, or with, are outside the system of power, and can therefore be divisive, like 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 uh, Picasso's Guernica. Uh, as well, so there is there is some capacity for culture to divide as well, and um, I can only refer to from an academic perspective the the very influential and important book, although I don't agree with it, The Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington, which is very much a response to Fukuyama's uh, end of history and the idea that we're coming together. Huntington spoke about the different civilizations, which have different traditions and beliefs uh, uh, about, about them, which is where along those fault lines is where he predicted conflict would occur. Uh, and that happens in some cases, but I think that it's very, very much overstretched. Yet culture can divide, uh, and it's important to recognize that. And it's also important to recognize that a lot of what generates conflict is and, and which culture cannot overcome, even if it's not divisive, is the material self-interest that, that, uh, that causes people to act and to take positions. Self-interest in terms of uh, whether it's fiscal deficits and budgets or trade balances or whatever it may happen to be. No amount of cultural understanding in some cases will overcome those divisions in terms of material self-interest. So, with that in mind, we have to be wary of the divisive possibilities of culture and try, try our best to overcome them. Let me move to the third point because I know I don't have much time. Um, the use of purpose of culture, and I mentioned this yesterday, uh, I think that, uh, um, I, mean, I, I thought of Robert Cox, a um, um, Canadian academic who spoke about uh, theory, liberal theory as being a tool used by um, by, by academics and also by those in power for a purpose. That he said that theory is always for someone and for some purpose. And, sa and the same with culture, at least as, as some have described it. Joseph Nye talking about soft power and the ability to draw together um, American uh, values and ideas and cultures as a way to persuade others. This is again simply about American uh, attempts to persuade. It's, it's soft power, but it's still power. Others have spoken uh, about, uh, about this equally. Robert Conquest, who's an academic, has talked about the, the, the values of the Anglophone world as a way to say, look, the UK doesn't belong as part of the European Union. It's not, it's not like the rest of them. It's like the US. It's like, in the fact, the countries that he specifically mentioned were developed Anglophone countries, the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. For some reason, he didn't mention the other ones, the Kenyas, the Indias, uh, and others less developed, also Anglophone, at least uh, from, from colonial times. Um, but these uh, purportedly, according to, Robert, uh, um, according to Robert Conquest, take the, the UK uh, in a different direction. So the, the use of the purpose of culture, I think we need to be um, um, I think we need to be wary about it, think about. Uh, not all cultures are, are we, we, to paraphrase someone, all cultures um, are created equal, but some are more equal than others, in the eyes of some, at least, because, because they're the, the, the values that underlie them. The European Union does this as well. There's, a, there's a, a report from the European Parliament about this, about how the European Union can better use its own, its own, values, its own culture to promote its values of participation and democracy. Very good things, very good things that we would embrace. But these are, again, forms of power. The EU as a normative power still is a power. Finally, fourth point, um, and what we call in academia, in a very, the usual very clumsy way that we, that we tend to do, uh, an epistemic community. 
An epistemic community is a community of people who have gone through similar levels, similar kinds of training, whether in sciences or in law or in some other profession, economics or whatever, and emerge from those with a common understanding, a common language, a common technical language, and a common understanding of how to solve problems. And in my research, I found that, uh, that, that this has a very powerful effect on individuals, that this kind of technical understanding and training dissolves other forms of identity in terms of how to see the world. It has a dissolving effect to a certain extent. Let me give you an example. I was in the office of uh, Mexico's chief trade uh, negotiator, the head of the NAFTA office, which is um, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the regional organization Mexico belongs to. And, and I was, he was telling me about his American and Canadian counterparts, the other countries in NAFTA, and how close they, they feel to one another. They're all lawyers, they're all international trade lawyers. They have gone through periods, years of, 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 of interaction through negotiations and through problem solving and dispute resolution. And they do this in a very technical, technocratic way. He said they think the same exact way. They're, 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 they're legalistic and problem solving in their attitudes. When they meet together, wherever it is, they bring their wives. Their wives go out to dinner while, or go shopping or whatever while they uh, or partners, I should say, I think, I think it's all men that do the negotiating still in this case, at least in the Mexican case, but they, they come to the family homes of the others. They know each other that well. And I said, well, look, I'm going to go to Washington in a few days. Can, I, can you give me the number of your counterpart, your, or the contact of your counterpart in Washington? And he turned to his phone. This impressed me. Turned to his phone, touch tone phone, and he, and he started to do the dialing and that was the way he remembered the number. He called this person so often. So in a globalized world in which uh, issues of climate change, of, of, of trade and economic um, crises and, all, all, and disease control and all the other kinds of problems that have spilled across borders, in, in that kind of globalized world where we're training scientists and lawyers and economists and others to, to solve these problems, our, the, the understandings of those groups of people, the vocabularies and languages will draw them together in a way that will distinguish them as a group of people from others within their societies and when, within their purported cultures. This has happened, this has already been noted among central bankers, and it's a very important um, uh, 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 influence, I think, on the cultures. And with that, I'm going to draw it to an end. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to, to, to talk about these things further. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Aspinwall, for accommodating the time and covering this interesting speech in 20 minutes. We take a uh, few questions, if you have any questions. Morning. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you already briefly mentioned hunting and the people that you're referring to, sort of the elites of globalization, the technocratic elites. Um, he referred to them, and I think it was him who coined the term um, Davos people and Davos culture uh -huh. in recognition of the Davos Economic Forum. And um, he was mentioning exactly what you're mentioning. He's not elaborating on that because his book is very general and not very scientific. Um, but my question now to you is, this Davos culture, as he terms it, or your technocratic culture, is will this create greater understanding between countries? Because the elites of these respective countries um, understand each other so well, apparently know each other personally very well. Um, or will it be a divisive force in the sense that will, as you mentioned already, will create a disconnect between the elites and the people? So divisive or beneficial? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think that in, in among those who are, who are working on these, t uh, these technocratic problems, it will draw them together. And uh, as we educate, you know, we, we go for a target of 50% of higher education among our students in, in, in the UK. That's, the, that's kind of been a general, um, well, it was a target under labor. But we're, we're in that ballpark. Um, our, our students are entering a globalized world. They have access to information. They have access to other countries. They're there all the time. I do think that this tendency will grow, probably slowly, because not everybody is going to be an international civil servant or uh, a 
a bureaucrat or in a position of power in a company or, or some, where they're developing the kinds of standards and harmonizing rules which, which create this common understanding. But, but the tendency is for it to grow and for others to, to, um, to be drawn into it, to be drawn along. Where there, where there remain disagreements, though, these, these, this kind of um, exposure to others can probably, I, th I think, at least, at least in my, and again in my understandings of the Mexican and American cases, can um, exacerbate the divisions. The, the, I, I also have interviewed a number of, of environmental and labor NGOs in Mexico as a result of the research, which was about how the rule of law, as I mentioned, changes in Mexico. And there were, the NAFTA agreement had two side agreements, one on the labor and one on the environment, which require the member states to enforce their own rule of law, to force, enforce their own law. Not to have new law, but to enforce the ones that they have. And there are inspection mechanisms and scrutiny mechanisms where NGOs um, can, can complain, and a number of, of them did, about, both about environmental governance and, and labor governance. And on the labor side, they rea reacted very, very strongly, very negatively to, the, to any um, um, intrusion by the US or Canada into the affairs of labor governance within Mexico. So that they know each other well, and probably personally get along, the, the labor bureaucrats get along well but there still is a very nationalistic reaction against them. So I think the, the jury's out. Uh, as an optimist, I would say that it's going to increase understanding, though. Hi, Mark. Uh, Hi, John. Yeah, uh, just a very quick question. I thought it was a great talk, really smart. Um, just a quick question. Could you just say a little bit more about your understanding of normative power Europe? Please. Yeah, normative power Europe, which I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am uh, normative power Europe is the idea that uh, that the that the EU exercises power in a normative way. Um, I think there was one case study in the study that uh, Ian Manners did. Um, Ian Manners is an academic, I think, in, in Copenhagen, and a uh, very influential study of the of the foreign policy Im impact of the European Union. I'm not an expert on this in this area. I know a little bit about. What he did, uh, what he did find, which is that the that the, in, in 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 contrast to those who um, promote a kind of a, a hard power or a, a, you know a, e even a coercive soft power uh, approach, that through through um, th uh, through through its own norms, through its own behavior, the EU is able to have uh, influence in 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 a um, in an important way in international uh, affairs, international negotiations. Now, this has been um, roundly criticized, uh, not least by my colleague Chad Damro at the University of Edinburgh, who has written uh, about the EU as a market power, so that the EU, and we did, we did some studies on, the, or some colleagues did studies on this, that, that really showed a, a very, very big difference in the, and the attitudes and the behavior of the EU externally in, in, in what you would call security, broad high politics IR security areas on the one hand, where, where it d does tread very softly and, and presents itself as a normative power. And on the economic realm, where the EU and the European Commission in particular have a great deal of autom autonomy and power and have, and have promoted U, U, um, EU interests very, very vigorously and vociferously. So very different forms of behavior, depending on how much power the, the, um, the European Union, and particularly the European Commission, have in a given policy area. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, because I'm not an expert on the, on the external relations of the EU, and I'm, I'm yeah, OK. I can, we'll talk about it a bit later, but. Any other question? Okay, uh, we just covered in time. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thanks. A good applause for Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.